and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the upcoming fantasy punk adventure known as Dreadlore, and the man who has the who has had the classiest choice of drink of anybody I've had in the last few months here in the temple, the one and only Bill Bunkum. Try saying that five times fast. How you doing today, man? I am doing well. And I'm drinking Chardonnay. <laughs> um, but so it's a bit of a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Oh Lord! Okay. So, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it stick. All right. Uh, yeah. So I was around twelve years old back in the day, mm -hmm. doing my rollerblading thing. Yeah, and uh, one of my friends was like, "Hey, let's go play this game uh, in the apartment uh, adjoining." So we ro we rolled in there, and this is right around when um not to date myself, right around when World or I'm sorry Warcraft Two uh, was out, and people were going to LAN parties and playing it. Mm -hmm. So everyone played elves and stuff, and Mortal Kombat Two was out, and I liked that character Baraka, <clears throat> so. You know, I didn't know anything about Dungeons and Dragons, and that, that's what they were playing. So I was like, oh. They were like, make a character. I was like, all right. So I drew my character, and it was like this elf girl with Baraka arms. And that took me pretty much the entire session. Uh, finally, everyone was ready to play. I was like, I don't, I don't have a character. What? There are rules to this? I don't know what's going on. And they just started the narration. And the narration was... All the all the guy elves were out hunting in the forest, and orcs came in and slayed uh, everyone in the village in the elven village. And I was like, "Yo, I'm playing a girl elf," and they were like, "Oh, then you're dead." <laughs> so that was my intro to uh, AD and D, uh, and I said, "Screw that," and uh, didn't play until after I had a bachelor's degree. Which is certainly is certainly an interest is certainly an interesting um, approach. And what, when you did come back, was it still was it still AD? Were you still doing AD and D, or were you doing? It was, it was three five at that point. Um, it was three, three five. Yeah, three five had just come out, and uh, my buddies were were gaming mm -hmm. at a martial arts studio that they they all went to, and I was making fun of them just you know ad nauseum for doing this. And they were like, just come out and check it out. And so I did. And I sat in on one of the sessions. Mm -hmm. And I was enthralled by it. I thought it was so cool. Uh, it was like pure creativity with some rules. And uh, yeah, I was really into it. Uh, the, the DM at the time, he was, he was a classic antagonistic DM. Um, my character, I played a wild mage sorcerer. And right when I hit that prestige class level, uh, he sicked a red dragon on us, and we all died very quickly. Yeah. But after that, I started DMing, and um, I kind of didn't stop doing that. Like, that's kind of... I, I found that's where my place was. Yeah, and eventually, I went into vampire LARPs and all that crap into the seventh level of hell. Welcome to the, welcome to the Forever DM Club. <laughs> yeah. So, do you, um, even with that, did you, cons did, did you, I was, I would say, I would ask if you had stayed mostly with D&D, &D, but since you mentioned the seventh level of hell, um, obviously that didn't happen. You know, I stuck with D&D &D for a long time because, um, <laughs> I mean, at that point, like, obviously there was an internet, but social media was really, really new. So we just didn't really know of other stuff. Like, you had board games, you had WoW, which had just come out, um, and then there was just kind of like Shadowrun, D&D, and Star Wars D6. Mm -hmm. So we played those, and my buddies, uh, 
uh, actually, my girlfriend at the time was in a uh, masquerade game, Vampire the Masquerade Old World, mm -hmm. and man, I got into that, and it it really opened my brain up to this idea of what a game system was and and all of that. It's, that's that Tom's. Um, I'd say that certain. I'd say that certainly fits. Um, and that br that brings me to, um, Dreadlore, mm. which, for, I my question for Dreadlore is twofold. The first is how how the idea for this particular thing came about, and second, you've referred to it as a fantasy punk, um, role playing right. game, um. And I'd like you. I'd like you to go into what exactly that entails. Okay. Which one do you want first? Um, the origin story. Then we can. Then we can go into oh. what is fantasy punk to you. Okay. So it st It all started. So I was living in China, and I was I was back visiting, uh, visiting my friends and such and family, and one of my buddies at the time, said, "Hey, man, you know we're kind of finished with." D20 for reasons. Uh, do you want to make a game system with me? And I was like, man, I don't know. That sounds like a lot of work. <sighs> yeah, sure, let's do it. So we made this uh, this game system, which the working title was The Crack System, uh, because it's a crack up system and, you know, it's you want to do it all the time. Not that I've done crack. Anyway, it's called The Crack System. And uh, did you try and be too... cute and have it being an, and be an acronym? No, <laughs> no, we were not that clever. <laughs> it was just it's the crack system, right? That was it. Uh, yeah, people were like, "You need to change that name," and I was recalcitrant about it for a very long time until it became Dreadlore. Uh, at the beginning, it was two pages, and it was just straightforward rules. Um, the you, it was a D10 kind of system until we were like, no one has D12 systems. That's stupid. Let's make it a D12 system. And then we moved it back to a D10 once we realized how ridiculous that would be. Uh, not that it'd be ridiculous. It's just less easy uh, to do the, the maths. Um, nobody has nobody has a D at this. I realize I realize that information wasn't exa wasn't exactly as out there. But when you mentioned the whole thing about D12s, all I can think of is. Um, Riddle of Steel would like a word with you. <laughs> I don't know it. I don't. Although Riddle of Steel, you mean Conan? There was an R. There was a. There was an RPG called Riddle of Steel. Um, some year, some years, some years back, that was aiming for um a bit of combat realism, and it had mm -hmm. two successors: Blade of the Iron Throne and so Song of Swords, which were very um Hema inspired. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah. No, it doesn't surprise me. We just we just weren't aware of it. Um, yeah, the Riddle of Steel. Uh, cool. Yeah, I need to check it out. Anyway, at the time, uh, we didn't know about that. Uh, we we started creating this system together. Uh, we started a Kickstarter, and then everything fell through. And that was like 2015. So I got back into town, or back from abroad in the latter part of 2013. And for a couple years, we worked on the system. We had version 1.0 out, and uh, we were about to pull the trigger on it, and just, you know, things happened, and that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so I eventually finished that book, uh, you know, smoting its ruin upon the mountainside, <laughs> uh, pieced out for a while, and one of my other buddies who creates games... Uh, he created this game called Levied Souls, which is really interesting. Um, and he, he hasn't yet published it. Uh, he was like, man, I really like this Dreadlore game. I like the base mechanic of bidding traits and this kind of thing. Um, will you run a game for us? And so I, uh, I ran an Into Space game. At the time, I wasn't aware. So I, I'd written... Do you know what NaNoWriMo is or NaNoWriMo? Yes. I've never yeah, taken so, part in it, but I have some colleagues who have. I'm aware dude, of Dude, so there was a girl I dated. She's um, an amazing author, and she was like, we should do NaNoWriMo. So I wrote this book. It is awful, but 
it's 60,000 words. You know, you're going for quantity over quality. And I called it Into Space. Uh, or I'm sorry, Star Trek. And then the game that was based off it was called uh, Into Space. So I'm sitting there running this game for these guys. And they're like, man, this is so cool. And one of my buddies goes, you know, this really reminds me, this setting really reminds me of The Expanse. And I was like, what's The Expanse? <laughs> So basically, into space is the expanse. Oops. Um, anyway, my buddy was like, "Look, I really dig the game, but I think there's some clunky rules to it. It's like you're trying to do two different games at the same time. Let's let's here here's some ideas and then run with it. And that's essentially what I did. And that is what eventually, over the last two years, Dreadlore, the one that's actually uh, about to be published, is, has become. Mm-hmm. But no one that was working on it in the beginning or in the middle is working on it now. It is only me. Well, you know, you know, you know the old expression: if you want, if you want something done right, sometimes you got to do it yourself. And I, I hope that's true. <laughs> um, I mean, th- this this adventure has been about eight years in the making. Um, I've I've worked. So this this version of it, the the official version of Red Lore is about a year and a half old, but the actual project started in two thousand twelve, two thousand thirteen. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I've definitely made a lot of different games by making this one game, which which certainly makes certainly makes sense. But um, when it comes to now, that brings me to um, this idea of fantasy punk. Right. Um, which the last the last time I heard that now it's not the first time I've heard that phrase. The last time I did was when was when John Wick did a did a lengthy rant about everything he hated in D and D third edition. Um, really? Or rather, actually, I, I tell a partial lie. In his case, he had he w- he had called the art style dungeon punk, which I still cool. have no idea what he meant by that. Um, I think that, it just sounds cool. Um, but. What, but what is what is the idea? What is the idea of fantasy punk to entail? Okay, so I, I have two approaches to this question. There's the the very the abstract, and then if need be, I can go into it. Mm-hmm. We'll start um, with the abstract, then we yeah, can yeah. think about going into the weeds. So the idea is, uh, punk refers to something that is grimy, uh, the feel of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> the idea that there that that engines and and technology is greasy and big and uh you know there's pollution and um there's a uh, a a a darkness to the world um so that's the punk part and then fantasy meaning that there are things like uh magic and chaos entropy that sort of thing mm-hmm Entropy is maybe the wrong word. That probably goes along with punk, but yeah, you're you're not supposed to expect. I should say you are supposed to expect the supernatural, more than natural of of our world, uh, in this very punk setting. Which I I can I can cer- I can certainly get that I can certainly get that. Um, now. When we now getting into getting into the weeds, um, when I a lot of a lot of people, the closest thing that they think that they think of with the punk aesthetic in fantasy is um, is is stuff like steampunk. Somet- sometimes some degree of magic punk, a, a la um, Eberron. But um, in that particular paradigm, what would what would you say something like Dreadlore is analogous to? So I'd say it's. Uh... You're, if you had a Venn diagram, it's somewhere in between. It it has it has bits and pieces of both. Uh, there's there's absolutely steam, uh, steam powered things in the world, mm-hmm. because it's it's. Well, we're in the weeds, so I can explain this. <clears throat> the idea of saying like, like in a D and D game, in typical to Greyhawk, uh. Are there guns? Yes. Is there gunpowder? Well, we'll call it smoke powder or something. You know, some 
other name that lets people say, well, okay, this is not natural gunpowder. You know, maybe you need magic to use it, or maybe you need a certain kind of device to use it. Whereas in reality, if you understand how to make gunpowder, anybody can make it. Mm-hmm. And you can go you there forth. But that breaks the system in some ways. Um, because people people can say, well, wait a minute. If you have gunpowder, then you can do something else, and I can have steam engines and blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. You know, steampunk doesn't work uh, if you actually take it to its fantastic end. Um, you know, there's just better ways of doing that. That's why we, we did what we did in the world. So how do you, how do you deal with that? Uh, if, you, if you tell people, okay, well, technology works different in this world, as in, in, in the world in Dreadlore is called Craster. Technology works different in Craster. Okay, cool. So you're telling me that if I heat up a bunch of water with fire and pressurize it, it doesn't, it can't be used for power? See, it breaks down really fast. You're like, no, water doesn't work that way. <laughs> you know, like, of course there's steam power. Uh, and in that regard, there'd be steampunk. But when you say steampunk, you're talking about a genre as well. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, like a, a Miyazaki film where <clears throat> there's a little bit of Final Fantasy style magic uh, going on there. And that's more of the line that Dreadlore's talking about. Uh, I call it Thergy. Thergy is a kind of Egyptian mysticism and alchemy. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's where I got it from is what I mean. Um, so when you're talking about the steampunk engines in Craster, which would be called Thergic engines, um, or Sprock is the other name for them, then they can be clockwork or they could be alchemical. And that's the catch-all phrase. If it's alchemical, is it alchemical because you're using the spice? Uh, the reference should be plain. Or is it alchemical because you're using different compounds to make steam to blah, 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 blah. That, and I can cer- I can certainly get behind that. Um, and it's, it is it it is is interesting that you bring up um, Final Fantasy to me since um, I've had... It was a I've, huge influence. Yeah, and I've... I've um, I've had I've had to put I've had to put up with certain purists over the, over the years who have who have this idea that um that any that it that you are not allowed to take inspiration from video games when doing a, when making a role playing game really um well the the big case in point that I'll always bring up is the um is the scubness that was um the book of nine swords in third edition. <laughs> I both love and hate that book. Um, I love the lore. I love the lore. Uh, but man, I pissed off so many players. The moment you start taking those maneuvers, you just start breaking the game. And, you know, oh, as oops, if, I hit you, 101 ca- damage. <laughs> as if casters don't break the game already. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. You know, I, that's the thing. That's one, this is off subject, but or a tangent. But I do like the idea of how Fifth Ed at least is attempting to go back to that second ed feel of, hey, look, once you're level twenty, you might need to make a new character. Um, whether or n- I I can see the attempt, whether or not it's successful is a story an for attempt. another day. It's uh, an attempt. <laughs> um, although it, I'm trying, I'm trying not, I'm trying not to come off like I'm praising with faint dams. <laughs> That's a good. That's a good expression. Mm-hmm. But anyway, pardon with, the the tangent. Yeah, but with with that with that said, um, now given the given the fact that yours that this particular this particular setting that you have with Dreadlore is is dealing with a dealing with a world that's on a slow pre apocalypse, um, mm. in the in the form of Craster, right, um. Within the, within that, would you would you say would you say that um, that this le- that this leans and that the setting and the tone of Dreadlord leans a bit into the Grimbright, um, the whole idea of things are, things are bad, but there are people who are trying to make it better. Yeah, I mean, I hate I hate I hate doing that because. 
I have a little bit of that punk in me. But yeah, that 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 does make sense. Mm -hmm. It's <clears throat> you're playing so as a player character the way that it's described is you have a burning soul, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. As in your your soul is actually a light. Whereas most most people's we actually don't call it really souls, it's more it's it's called focus like your chakras, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, most people's souls, the weight of the world has caused them to go guttering, and they're wavering, basically. But because of who you are, you're not necessarily a hero, um, but you're striving for more than that. So it's not necessarily that you're trying to make anything better, right? Like, I don't want it to be fatalistic and uh, nihilistic, you know, as in there is no good, there is no bad. It's 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 not postmodern in that regard. Um, although maybe at one time it was. It's more, you're going to do great things. It's more Harry Potter about it. <laughs> you know, you're gonna do great things. Uh, the quality of those great things, the aftermath, who knows? Yeah. And it has a very, I've realized because I have I have several friends um, and acquaintances that are into uh the north norse sorry norse mythos mm -hmm. and some of them are you know proper norse pagans and everything and what i've been told is really unintentionally uh i've taken a lot of derivative from you know things like the vikings and those sorts of things you know, the idea that craster is creation and creation is the body of a dead god is straight out of norse mythology um you know what i'm saying like mm -hmm. and and that idea of slowly moving towards uh, a final end which could be a beginning that's essentially the basis of ragnarok mm -hmm. and that was pretty much unintentional on my part it was just I, I thought this was cool and that was cool and these other things were cool. And they're, of course, influenced by old mythos and mythologies and whatnot. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're trying to write your name, uh, do great deeds, gain an immortality, which is essentially uh, your reputation. Mm. You, you remember that movie Troy, the Brad Pitt movie? Yeah. And that conversation that uh, he and his mother had, where she's like, well, you can go off to the Trojan War. Uh, this is Achilles. You can go off to the Trojan War, and you'll become a legend. But you'll die. You can stay here, and you'll live a good life. And he's like, oh. But, you know, if, I ha if I'm a legend, I'll never die. And that, that's kind of the feel. Your deeds in the game uh, matter, because what a player does literally affects the fiction. Mm -hmm. in Dreadlore. And also in the sort of meta game uh it affects the you know the mechanics. Which makes which definitely makes definitely makes sense. And speaking of mechanics, um before we get before we get into how that whole how that whole legend thing com comes about. Um I the, let's get let's get into brass tacks about the core um, die, the the place where all ro the place where all roads lead to. I know you hinted at D12s versus D10s, but are you? D but what sort of um what sort of die mechanic is gonna is gonna be used most frequently? Okay, so you're always gonna be rolling a D10 alongside, often alongside another die. That other die could be uh, D4, 6, 8, 10, or 12. Mm -hmm. And you're rolling these two dice. Uh, you're looking for successes on the dice. And you add up your successes against a difficulty, which is called a threshold. Which, which, that, which that certainly makes sense. Um, now, given, given that... Um, when I looked at the when I looked at the when I looked at the character sheet and I saw it separated into traits, crunch, crunch and the um and the goals. Um, mm. 
would you say would you say that Dreadlore is leaning a bit more on the narrativist end of things? So, if you're defining narrativist, how? Um, in ter in terms of the in terms of the emphasis is going to be on the on ca on characters on character story, and a bit and a bit of abstraction when it comes to what when it comes to what's on the character sheet compared compared to some compared to something that's a bit more crunch heavy. Um, uh, just with that question, I'd say it's it's definitely uh, as they say story now. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, to reference, to reference, you know, some some old game system theory. Uh, I really liked the Forge, and it it has influenced a lot of how I think about game systems and building games. Mm -hmm. um, but when you get into a story now or a narrative style game, one of the fundamental ideas is that whatever number you have is kind of like what you are. And so you don't have to think about the numbers anymore. And it's more about, you know, let's play in the, the world of narration. Um, and everything's kind of relative to that, whatever that number is. And Dreadlore's not really about that so much. But there is a... I, I get away with it semantically with saying it's it's the action is on you. Um, and you're changing the fiction, and the arbiter, which is the game master, is folding whatever you've done into the fiction. So it's a it's a, it's a collaborative effort there. So that's balanced with the crunch when you throw down, uh, which is literally the mechanic to throw down your dice um, against the threshold, and that will determine, you know, by the numbers. And there's a probability there because you're throwing down dice, right? They can be high or low or whatever. That's going to influence what the fiction is. Yeah. Now, when it comes now um, when it comes to one of the one of the other thing when it comes to the setup, um, would it be fair of me to say that you're a, that you're aiming for a more free form approach? You're not aiming for cl classes or archetypes. Right. Yeah, there are no classes. Mm -hmm. Now, when I looked at the when I looked at the character sheets, something else that I something else that I saw that is a distinct a distinct lack of an of an equivalent to skills. Mm. Right. Um. And when it and. I'm gu I'm guessing I'm guessing that was intentional so that there was that intentional to reduce the possibility of skill bloat. Uh yeah to a degree um so it's the same I will kill two rocks with one bird. Do -do 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 uh I think skills and initiative are very good in certain games. Mm -hmm. I mean you know, really we're we're, we're talking about they're, they're just semantics, right? For how the game is actually balanced mathematically. But the idea of skills and the idea of initiative are not needed uh, in a game. And, and it's very easy to assume that they are. So when you... And the reason they're easy to assume you are or that, that they're needed is because, you know, the godfather of all gaming is Dungeons & Dragons. And it has initiative and skills. Mm -hmm. you know, to deal with certain situations. And you have all these derivatives that, that uh, come after it, and you get that skill bloat. Um, you get a lot of rolling and, you know, games that lack any kind of juice, any, any kind of inspiration. Uh, I, I, I don't want to bash any particular games, but I will one. <laughs> Uh, so the the D twenty version of Star Wars. Uh, um, back in which the day. which D twenty version? Not Saga. Okay. The one prior. Although I will bash the hell out of some Saga. I think it's a good system, but I'll bash it anyway. Uh, the one previous to that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the skills. I see what they were going for, but I don't think it worked well. 
And in 3-5, honestly, it didn't really work well. I'd yeah. say I'd say the pro the problem with I'd say the problem in the case of skill use in D twenty as a whole is it was never is that it was never designed with skills in mind from the outset. Mm. Um, you look at a lot you look at a lot of games outside of that, and the sk their skill system for better or worse is baked in. Whereas D and D didn't really adopt a skill system in the traditional sense until third edition. Right, right. You know, and and that that's that's something like. So I was playing games like Call of Cthulhu, right? Mm -hmm. Which the the mechanics in in Call are just <laughs> there's something to behold, but they work so well for that system and that setting. I should say they work so well for that setting, um, and it, it's kind of all you need. Mm -hmm. You know, even to this day, when I'm running a fifth edition game in D and D, will I call for a reflex save? And it, it's just baked into my brain. Oh yeah, I can make a reflex save, and my players who were new to D and D, and they've only ever seen fifth ed, look at me like I kicked a cat. Like what? What the hell's a, a reflex save? And I'm like, oh right, 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 right. When you think about the abstraction of a will reflex or fort save, it's it's neither bad nor good, but it's not necessarily needed. Okay, so to get back to Dreadlord, <clears throat> the idea is this. I was attempting to cull the herd, so to speak, because in the first version, in the crack system, you had all of those things. And I realized that... You can either have an exhaustive list of these things, in which case you end up having a, a well, the skill bloat. There's always going to be a skill that it's like, well, is this a specialty or I'm making a house rule about it? Why do you even have an exhaustive list? Or you go the other way, which is what Numenera did, where it's like, oh, here's some suggestions for skills. And then you have players that are like, well, wait a minute, I can choose anything. And they end up making the mistake of making a character that's not effective. Because they're like, oh, I want to be good at sneaking and stealth and sleight of hand. When in reality, all that game is actually asking is, do you get uh, essentially a plus three to your role? Which, by the way, is my problem with Numenera. Mm -hmm. We can go there later. Um. Although that brings me in, that brings me to an, into something else, um, a big pr um, exhaustive skill systems, and and go and going freeform can lead to an issue that I've talked about with um, pe with people plenty of times over the years of analysis paralysis, um, mm. where where um, where there's so, where there's so there's so much in the way of options that it's that um, people be that people um, have issue pick picking what they're going to do because they don't want to end up having that biting them on the ass three sessions down. Right. Um, and it's, espe it's especially an issue with games that have um, design traps. I'll put I'll put it that way, or or um, think or things that things that are not going to be as useful but seem but seem mainly there to trap people. Um, the way th the way 3.0's um, feet system works is a prime example for me, at least, of this kind of thing. Mm. Right. Well, you know, <clears throat> you you get a feat. What was it? Every is it third level in in three five or three oh? Um. And then you, you take get, dodge, and you're like, "Why did I do that?" Every, <laughs> it was every it was every fourth level for everyone else, well, every except for fighters who would get a. Who would get what would, what would be considered a fighter bonus feat every other level, which ended up earning them the nickname of the Feater. Um, and of course, of course, because of the fact that feats weren't exactly organized, they had to, they had to, they had to list out what fi what feats counted as fighter bonus feat as as its own individual oh, sets, yeah. instead of instead of putting it as say a tag so that it could be easily That's searched. Right. That's right. Yeah, you know, and that that's the thing, you know. Feats. What in the hell are feats? Right, like like I know what they are in 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 a in a three point five game. I actually didn't play third ed. I played three five, 
Um, so there, there's a, there's a few differences, um, you know, that I know from, from those two versions. When I looked at it, I said, oh, well, this is what a game is. This is what a tabletop role-playing game is. Mm -hmm. And from there, uh, you know, I was introduced to Vampire and D6's systems and all that. And all, all, all of these ideas. So in Vampire, you know, a point-by system, I started making characters like I would make a D&D &D character. And very quickly was I Diablerized. Right, mm -hmm. just because there's a when you get down to it, how does the math work? Is how people are going to play the game eventually. You know, when you play poker, not that I'm good at poker, there's certain things you don't do because you don't win that way. And this gets down into you know the forge theory of D and D's a gameist game. You're trying to win, and so you want to bend. Uh, the mechanics to your will, uh, like Sauron, so that you win. And that gets into the goal of the system itself. So the goal of Dreadlore is to have a collaborative story. If the entire party dies, awesome. That's like a Call of Cthulhu game. Awesome. Do it. And the system can support that. If you're a bunch of heroes that are attempting to save the day, you can do that. Or the game that I literally just finished, it was called Deus Mortus Est, which I looked up, and it means the gods are dead. The gods of Dreadlore are dead, is what it means. Mm -hmm. It's the final age that's prophesized in the book as the era doth end. And the players uh, played through the end of the world. And it, it's all about, you know, they all essentially caused the end of the world. And yet this 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 three year game explosion of brain mm -hmm. uh, was awesome, right? That's what it's supposed to support. I mean, who likes a D and D game where you're in the dungeon and you're like, oh, you just found whatever that monster is that's for some reason underground in a dungeon hanging out for a while in a room, right? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go in there and we all die. Yeah, that was cool. No. I mean, one person might be like, ha, 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 I did the thing with my one feet and my spell. But you lost. You guys lost. Try again, put in a new quarter. And getting people to shift from that video game mentality, which is fine, video games are awesome, but getting them to shift from that mentality is actually quite difficult. And also, maybe they don't want to. You know, if you if you really like World of Warcraft, because which I know is 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 like a thing right now, so maybe I should use something else. If you really like an MMOG, other than that game, uh, for the purposes of PvP, mm -hmm. you're not probably gonna like Dreadlord. In truth, because it's not about hey, I roll my my massive die, you roll yours. Well, I built my character awesome, so I win. That is not how the game works. <clears throat> Instead, it'll be, oh, so-and-so is going to win that fight because they were creative and they figured out the lay of the land. And, you know, they did death from above or something. Um, I'm doing, D doing DFAs. What, um, I'm sorry, I can't, I, can't hear, I can't hear DFA without, without thinking of Battletech. <laughs> Yeah, man. <laughs> um, just, re just, re just remember, um, never, never forget November thirtieth. Never trust a clan. Never trust a capellan. And clanners suck. <laughs> um, oh, the geek is deep. <laughs> you have no, you have no idea how de how deep the how deep <laughs> that rabbit hole goes around here. <laughs> um, but, but. That but that brings me to to um so, to so a different aspect I wanted to go into because what I did notice just looking at just looking at the character sh just looking at the sheet is that the big the bi the the big the big bit of attention seems to be on um traits and what I was curious about and this is why. 
the whole analysis paralysis um, came came up because is it a case where trait where you have traits specifically categorized around theme or or something like that or is it or is it everything a everything's on the table kind of setup so that's been a big question um the game as it is now as in that's been a big question leading up to uh to up to now mm -hmm. or recent the game as it is now is such if something is appropriate and you know the words are chosen carefully here uh, if the arbiter the game master thinks that it's appropriate then it, it goes um, initially traits were categorized and you could so the dreadlord 2.0 is really what it what it is and it was a very player happy game you had tons of agency like you could on your turn you could be like okay what i'm going to do i've got like eight eight different things i can do to add to my role or change the whatever blah 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 and it works it works really well it's very um slow but meaningful. <clears throat> so when you have a turn, man, it really matters, and other people can be involved. That That's how it was. What I did not like about that was for players that, for players that were very crunchy, it was glorious, and they loved it. But everyone else was like, wait, hold on. I don't want to make a wrong move. And I was like, you know, what I want is the narrative to be uh, the prime mover. Everyone to be thinking of where is my character, what am I doing, why am I doing it, and describing that. Well, how am I doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, what what is the what is the outcome that I actually want to happen? Oh, I attack the monster. Well, okay, what do you want to happen? Are you trying to kill it? Are you trying to stab it? Are you trying to hold it down? Are you are you making a sacrificial move as you you know everyone gets through the the portal like what are you doing i want that to be the tension and the goal and everything about the game and so when you have to deal with mechanics you throw down dice you check them boom you're back up into the narrative you're back up into the fiction and we're all playing in this collaborative way so i simplified it heavy uh traits or traits or traits unless specified otherwise so there's a couple of them that have more of a mechanical uh bonus for example if you looked at the, the character sheet there's one called focus mm -hmm. and um that's essentially your soul level uh if you spend if you bid your focus everyone has to agree that you can do it and as in uh, all the players do because only one player, a game session, can do it. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you gain a whole bunch of benefits. The idea is you are actually bidding this thing, right? So there, there, there are certain traits that matter a little bit more. They're, they're higher on the totem pole than others. Uh, traits that you gain from your backgrounds, your, your sort of core. In the event it was contested, let's say it was a PvP thing, and someone was like, oh, I'm going to steal the bag of gold that you have hanging off of your belt. All right, I'm going to use whatever trade I do. Let's say the nimble fingers, that's one that I've created. Bam, I, I, I bid that, I do it. You know, I pass a note to the arbiter. Cool. Well, old dude can say, well, hold up. I've got this background trait, as in it's a trait that was given by the background, the core of my character, that says... I'm always aware of everything. And right now I'm just spitballing. Let's say that mm -hmm. that is a deal. I bid that. Oh, well, that's going to supersede. And the reason is because you can't ever get those again, right? It's more important. It's higher in the totem pole. Mm -hmm. But beyond those situations, essentially your traits are your resources. Um, you are more powerful when you have more traits. As you advance, as you gain... Um, power essentially as you move towards your goals you're getting more traits more and more and more and those are your resources 
Now, when it comes <coughs> when it comes to when it comes to the traits. Now, some of some of these I was I was able to more or less fi more or less figure out um how how they how they end up playing out. Um the one that the one that I'm one that I'm the two that I'm curious about in this regard are gifts and kit choices. What would those entail? Okay, some of this has to do with semantics. Um, so, I'm gonna I'm gonna bastardize a uh, a quote, and I know it's not actually from Stephen King, but call it a meme. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna bastardize a meme. Mm -hmm. You have to kill your darling, and it's real hard to do. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, but it's real. I I, I don't know where that comes from. I know there's a hullabaloo about it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's real hard to do. In previous versions of the game, we've had certain semantics. And every so often I'll say, Ugh, I need to get rid of that. So gifts, the reason they're called gifts instead of traits, because they are just traits, is because they supersede other traits. Because they're, they're given from your core backgrounds. Right, so the idea of that naming convention was, hey, look, <clears throat> the rule is, if this is from your core backgrounds, then they kind of override other traits. But people have to remember that. So instead, we just call them gifts. Mm -hmm. Boom. Oh, I'm bidding a gift. It's like a gift. It's like a a trait with a little asterisk. Uh, a kit. So. I noticed when people were making characters, they, they asked the same questions. They'd say, okay, well, I, I, ha I started this character and I really wanted to play this thing, whatever the archetype or whatever the, the ideas they had. And so they would pick their backgrounds and their gifts, etc. And once they were done, they would say, okay, well, what equipment do I have? And what sort of powers can I pick? Because there's no, there's no classes, so you know, what do you do? You have this book of information. How do you choose? Mm -hmm. A kit is under the hood. What it really is, is it's a pointer to what you kind of should already have because you're that background. Mm -hmm. So your backgrounds are chronological. Um, there's an exhaustive list. Let's say you picked, let's say you want to be Aragorn, right? So you probably, and you, let's say you have three backgrounds that's chosen by your arbiter. So you probably pick fortunate, because Aragorn in is is born, uh, you know, from a line of heroes, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> probably fit, uh, pick fortunate. Then you'd go off to what maybe uh, he's a healer, so apothecary. Um, so you're you're dealing with your your medicines and and uh, uh, crap. What's the, what's the weed called that they use? It's like it's not King's Root. I can't remember what it's called. It's the leaf he uses, the herb he uses to, mm -hmm. in the movie at least, to heal Frodo. Although in the book, I don't think it's him that does it. Anyway, whatever. And then you might go into Ranger, because, come on, Aragorn is a Ranger, right? Yeah. So boom, boom, boom. Well, based on those backgrounds, you should have certain powers and equipment. And that's what the kits are. Mm -hmm. Now... When it comes to um, get when it comes to gifts, um, I could be the smartass and bring up the Monty the whole Monty Hall thing, but I get the feeling that's not that would not be accurate. I actually don't know the Monty Hall thing. Um, I'm not I'm not even that old, and I feel like I'm showing my age. <laughs> um, this Monty Hall as I. It was the host of Let's Make a Deal when that when that show was on was starting out, and in context, it is a overly generous GM. But I get the feeling that get I get the feeling that gifts in terms of a trait is a uh, is some is some sort of talent that you have that doesn't really qualify into other, into other aspects. Yeah, I think you could say that. Um, 
And so, oh, go ahead. Go, go on. Go on. When it comes now, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to um powers, um, is that is that where the is that where the bulk of characters' actions are go are going to be coming from? Right. So. It's 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 been wild to me how you have a you have a simple idea and it's so hard to describe that simple idea. Mm -hmm. I've gone through multiple edits of this kind of thing. Basically, powers are abilities. But what are abilities? They're things you're able to do, right? So <clears throat> the way it's described is someone picks up a, a club or a sword just to go to combat. Mm -hmm. um, they can swing that and do damage. Well, who can do that? Anyone who can lift the club and hold it and swing it can do that. You don't need a power for that. You know, much older games might even have a power for that. I can swing my club, right? Mm -hmm. Instead, you want to say, well, okay, well, what's an ability that you don't get right off the bat? Maybe it's casting some sort of magic, or as it's called in the game, Magicka. Mm -hmm. That would be a power. It's something that you can do that others can't. Now, just because you can do something that others can't doesn't mean you're going to do it all the time. Because, you know, just because, I don't, I don't know, let's say you can juggle really well, that doesn't mean you're always juggling. You, you're going to use it when it's appropriate. And that's what powers are about. Powers are not necessarily what make you powerful. They're just abilities. Uh, I think something synonymous with this <clears throat> or analogous to this would be in Vampire the Masquerade, having a lower generation makes you more powerful. You're closer to the source of vampirism, Cain, right? Mm-hmm. But what trumps everything is age. So if you have a thousand-year-old Methuselah vampire who's eighth generation, they're just flat out going to destroy a fourth generation who's five years old. Right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is you can have a lot of powers, and they're, they're really good things. They're very potent um, things to go into. But that doesn't mean you're powerful depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to go from the vampire deal again. Uh, a dragon, you know, you don't go into a dragon's lair to fight it. Why would you do that? You're going to lose. Not, but Not unless you've got an ace in the hole. Then you have the ace in the hole, right. Mm -hmm. But if... You can put if you can create a situation uh, where you have the advantage, then then there you go. Uh, does that answer the question? Yeah, and speaking of that, since we kind we kind of delved in we kind of delved into this when talking about um, rules of rules of magic for different settings, and and why um, why trying to do a one size fits all when it comes to that is something you, is something you can't do halfway. Um, I'd like to talk about the magic system that you've got for Dreadlore. Um, oh yeah. Now it is a headache. <laughs> it's a headache to figure. It's a headache to figure out magic systems. Um. Well, San Sanderson seems to have seems to have got it down to a science, but Sanderson is a madman who doesn't who doesn't know how to sleep. Who is Sanderson? Uh, Brandon Sanderson. Um, he's the guy behind Mistborn and the Stormlight Archive. To name a to name a couple of things, he's also the guy who finished up the Wheel of Time after oh. uh, after Jordan had passed away. All right, I'm gonna I'm I'm not gonna say a word. Continue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the dude. Uh, from what I understand, because so I told you I'm a punk. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Here's the thing. I respect the Wheel of Time. Everyone's like hackles just raised. I know. Grab a cushion because I feel a butt coming. 
<clears throat> I respect. <laughs> I respect the Wheel of Time. And you know what? I respect Diablo 2. That was a pun, by the way. Diablo 2. I respect this, this game. And I respect the franchise. And I really like the cinematics. Um, but you know what? Uh, I, I, I have not delved into them. That'll be my nicety. And it irks me that everyone likes them. Okay. He's probably awesome. I'm sure he's written really, really good stuff. Continue. Um, the big reason what the big reason why I br why I bring up him is he's do is he's done a variety of magic systems that do that none of them if you were to try and convert them into the into um the Vancian model that D and D has been using for years um things would start things would start to fall apart really fast and that's the reason why I always. I always, I always get, I always get on people when they don't um, go into how magic works in their setting, at least in some regard, whether it be the, whether it be the magic is subtly everywhere thing that Tol that Tolkien has, or whether it be something where magic is far more quantifiable, like you see in a lot of um, tech punk kind of settings. Just you gotta, you gotta throw me some kind of bone, and okay. go on. That that brings me to the way magic is going to work in Dreadlore. Is it a, is it a high case where magic is relatively commonplace? Is it a low case where only a ver only a very select isolated few know how, know how to use it? And even that and even even the whole know how to use it as a stretch in those cases. Um, where does it fit in that paradigm? <clears throat> Excuse me, I must, I must drink more of this wine. Just a moment. <laughs> okay. I'm stuck on the Tolkien thing. Will you repeat your question? Um, I had used... It's more It's more of a question of do you consider Dreadlord's use of magic to be on the high end of the spectrum or the low end of the spectrum? Okay, so is it high magicka or not? Yeah, the, the, key, di the key difference <laughs> is how is how frequent and how commonplace magic is. Oh man, it's so loaded. It's so loaded. <laughs> I love it. It's a good question. Um but it's loaded as hell. Okay, so let me go through it. This is going to be a contentious statement that does not have to do with Dreadlore. <sighs> I like contentious statements. I god, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make so many people butt hurt. Welcome, in, welcome to the club. We make people butt hurt <laughs> at least three times a day. In Tolkien, uh, magic is not everywhere. As, as is my opinion. I would consider Tolkien's universe of Middle Earth low magic. And the reason, the reason is this, and this is this is contentious, it can be argued, and I would love it to happen. But it does deal with Dreadlore. Magic is not everywhere. It is, in fact, based on your station and your authority. So, if you're an Ishtari, <clears throat> or a Maya, or whatever, or a Maya, I should say, you, you, you essentially have access to it, we'll say. You have the authority. However, you can't show it in front of mortals. So, is magic everywhere? I'm sorry, is magic everywhere? Things are fantastic everywhere as compared to our world. But magic, the way you get magic is by having the authority to use it. Is that correct? That is my opinion. Go. Like, like I said, it's, it's a very, it's one of those, con it's one of those contentious things. The big, re the big reason why I brought, why I brought that up is something that Steve, something that Stephen Long had br had brought up when he, with his um attempt at a Lord of the Rings RPG mm. um when talking about sub when talking about subtle magics where even you even using the words of of certain individuals can have effect oh yeah okay i dig that all right so so tolkien has been such an influence on the game and and i'm going to get into magic mm mhm 
Whew. It all started. So I, I'd mentioned my buddy uh, who, who made a game, Levied Souls, and he was really struggling with the idea of magic. Um, in the games that he ran, you know, it was, it was very situational. Oh, do you have enough? Let's go down to a roll. Does what you want happen? Blah. Mm-hmm. And I developed a magic system for him. Um, and then realized, holy shit, that's the magic system I want to use in Dreadlord. It goes like this. <clears throat> You have to be bound. If you're going to have rules, you have to be bound. Because rules bind you. They, 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 they tell you what you can and cannot do, right? Mm-hmm. So within those bounds, you can have levels. Uh, I think that... Oh, I'm going to mess this up. Because I only really know the, the new world. Uh, Mage the Awakening. You know, an entire... Yeah world of darkness system that's that's set to wizards right they do a really good job of showing very flexible a very flexible system of magic so i'm influenced by this Mm -hmm. the way it works is this you have what's called the scrolls of magica and there are three that people can actually use um there's the natural which the natural is the natural realm. That's what everyone lives in. Uh, in D&D speak, that would be planes of existence. So the natural, uh, the prime material, basically. Mm-hmm. So the natural realm, natural magica. This is anything dealing with the natural realm. Uh, it's subdivided. Then you have the unnatural magica. And then you have the gray, which is a catch-all. Um... I say a catch-all sort of pejoratively. The thing is, it's that it's Magicka that works. It's like a Mm sidestep. Okay. So the way it works is this. If you are a natural mage, you're dealing with uh, elemental magic, um, and you're dealing with biomancy, which is the same as necromancy. So you're dealing with ethos, uh, the life force. And they call it ethos. All right. So the two forms of elemental magic, you have air and flame, and you have earth and ages. What this means is air and flame is fluidity. Um, You're moving things. Earth and ages has to do with the substance of things. And then, and there's more description, of course, in the book. And then biomancy has to do with the ebb and flow of ethos. Mm-hmm. These are things that are natural. They're the, not necessarily the elements that are, that are encased in everything. You know, it's not straight up alchemy where it's like, oh, the wood burns because there's fire in it and you're promoting the fire. It's not that. It's that you're manipulating uh, essentially heat. For example... If you want to be a frost mage, right? You would have air and flame magica. Because you would pull the heat from things mm-hmm. and cause it to freeze. And this is how a mage <clears throat> and a player has to think. And it really tries to hammer this home. These are your bounds. This is what you know. Play with it. Mm-hmm. Go you there forth. Now, how good are you? That has to do with a mechanic called manipulation, and it's a general thing. There's five levels of it, and it has examples for it. So the first one is humble, which means you can kind of do it in a mass globular form, and then eventually you get to prime, which means you can make like fucking snow angels and stuff. Mm-hmm. Should I curse? Um, we have we have we everything is on the table here when it here when it comes to it. We're not. We are right. not trying. We're not trying to be professional in any set, any I, way. I don't. I don't want to get you shadow banned. Um. Look, I look. I have. I have people much more. Fo- much more foul mouthed here on a week on a weekly All basis. Right. You right. are fine. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm sweating. I'm holding back. All right. So. <laughs> um. So that's the idea. That's the kind of mage you are. That's what you know. Boom. You do it. Mm-hmm. Everything is based on your action, and this goes. 
out of Magicka, it goes into everything you do in the game as a player. Uh, the first thing you do is you bid a trait. That is the flavor. It's the stepping off point for your intention. Mm -hmm. So it, the same it works with magic because all magic is, all magicka is, it's an ability you have. It's based on learning and all the, the, the different things, the instruments of magicka, the, the, the weird things you've done, whatever. What is your intention and what are you able to do? Bid your trait. What is it? Boom, what's your intention? And now let's go. Depending on what it is, will require a will or will not require throwing down. Mm -hmm. Now, a mage is not necessarily specialized. Although it'd be really cool if someone was like, you know, vow of whatever I won't use. Right? Mm -hmm. But technically, so long as you can gain the information uh in the story, you could be a mage that knows everything. I can, I can, I can certainly, get, I can certainly get that, and um, and it is powerful. Mm -hmm. Now, the mechanical side of this, mm -hmm. <clears throat> when you try to do something zany or uh, reckless or just fucking awesome, you have your action die, which is a die ten. That's the one you're always throwing down, uh, assuming that you need to throw down. You might not have to. Because sometimes you can just do stuff. Mm -hmm. But assuming you're throwing down dice, boom, your action dies, D10. You have whatever your aspect die is. That, that, that's where you're building your character. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be your D4, 6, 8, 10, or 12. You're throwing those down. If you're doing something chaotic, boom, you get a chaos die. That is a die 6. And on that die, if you roll a 1, it all fumbles. The whole thing goes to hell. But you can gain successes on that die. So mathematically wise, it's a risk, but you actually have a 50% chance of gaining an extra success other people wouldn't by being bold. Right? Because a success is a four up or so, four, five, or six on a d6. Now, how that applies to Magicka. Anytime you use Magicka or Theragy, which is the technology, you also have a Chaos die. So let's say you're like, I will end the world, which no mage is powerful enough to do. But let's say you say you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're at the world machine and you're about to like pull out the world machine butt plug, whatever the hell you're doing. You still have a Chaos die. Which means you can roll a one and it all goes to shit. Mm -hmm. Like what I did there? Yeah. Yeah, I see, I see where you're going with this. Um, now, since you mentioned the chaos die and, th and things, can go, things can go bad if you're rolling a one, um, what would happen in that situation if you roll a six? So... <clears throat> The way a chaos die, the way the way every die works is this: a one higher is always better mm -hmm. in the game. You always want higher. You never want lower. There is a caveat there, but that's 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 something completely separate, and it and it has to do with the arbiter running the game. For the players, you always want a high roll. So one is always, you know, less good than a higher number. You're looking for target numbers. Specifically, you're looking for four ups, which is one success, or eight ups, which is two successes. Mm -hmm. So if you have a six, you can ultimately get one success, right? You want a four up. If you roll a six, great. You got a success. That's what it means. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> there is a side rule. It's called flare. On a die 10, so you only have a die 10 and die 12. On a die 10, which is your action die, which means you can get it every time you throw down. So anytime you decide to bid, use one of your resources to do something meaningful, which is what bidding does. There's a chance 
when you roll that die 10, you gain a 10. If you have a die 12, for example, if your aspect is the highest it can be, which is that a die 12, mm -hmm. it could be a 10, 11, or 12. You get flair. And that is a narrative point. It gives you some control over the narration. So it's a mechanic that leads you up from the dice to say, okay, what do you want to do? How do you want to shape this? Let's say someone's coming at you with uh, a spear, right? You're, you're, you're going to get Jon Snowed in the Battle of the Bastards. Mm -hmm. They're, they've got a threshold that's stupid, so it's like a threshold of six. You roll your dice. You throw down. Boom. Let's say you get four. So that is not enough to get out of the way of damage. But let's say you get flare, which means you rolled a 10 or higher on your dice. That gives you narrative control. So you will take damage. But what happens? As the horses are coming in, as you're standing there gallantly with your massive sword, what do you choose happens? You're going to take damage. Mm -hmm. But you're telling the story now. Now we're up in that creative land. And you move forward. Let's say you take so much damage you die. Okay, well... What's that narrative point? What what's it worth? Because you got it. What do you do with it? Do you do you do you have just a little bit of life to stay alive? You're that hero that should have died. You got destroyed and you know impaled, but you're still alive. Do you slay the dude or throw your sword and try to hit, you know, whomever? What what is it? Mm -hmm. And that's where the mechanic comes in. Yeah. Um now, since we've um we've pit we've we've picked up we've picked on the big dogs when it comes to when it comes to fit when it comes to fantasy throughout this, um and this is where this is where one of my own biases ends up coming in, um, I've made it clear that I am that I am very that I am very critical of, um, way too oh, way too much love being go being given to the mages, especially when Monty Cook was running things, um, oh Monty Cook. I like I like you I like you cook but um we have a policy here in the temple we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are cremated equal um, so you don't like Monty cook no I'm, I'm saying I'm saying everybody gets the roast oh okay yeah we are e we are equal opportunity offenders and I only apologize to anybody I haven't offended yet don't worry <laughs> your don't worry your time will come indeed <laughs> but <clears throat> This is the this is the reason why I um I scoffed earlier about the about the idea of how broken um um the to the tome of battle could get if someone knew if someone knew what they were doing. Mm. That's not to that's not to say that it, that it being that broken is a is a good thing per se, but more of it's not a good look to it's not a good look when people complain about that being broken when. There are entire essays that could be written about certain caster builds that can that can get ridiculously broken to the point that the, in some cases that their entire parties all by themselves. Indeed, um, it's 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 pretty much a case of glass house throwing stones in glass houses, and a bit a bit of an issue a bit of an issue that happens especially when people are are um take are taking notes from the quote unquote big boys is get is of course giving lots of love to the casters and fuck all to any to, to the non casters which right a result as a result of that you have instance instances where um where a, say where say human fighter is treated as babby's first character um or for example uh and I'm just going to throw this back mm -hmm. To Saga, and the reason I don't like it, unless you house rule it. So you're a tenth level soldier, yeah. Well, I'm a first level Padawan, and I force choke you. You have no idea how pissed off I made. So I made some tables when I, when I, de when I declared nobody's playing Jedi. Dude, well done. And. 
The well reason, fucking done. The reason why the reason why is the same reason. Are you familiar at all with um, Star Wars Galaxies? I I I know of it. Well, for for my my geek friends are strong. Well, <laughs> Ralph Coster, who who was the who was a le who was a lead designer on the on the project, fought against Sony Online Entertainment for years about putting Jedi in the game. And mm. the reason the reason that he get the reason that he gave as to why he was against it until until Sony forced his hand near the during um I think it was I think it was during the NGE era was the fact that in his words Jedi are an alpha class when they're in the when the, because because of how cool the whole all the stuff with the lightsaber and the force is everybody's going to want to be that but eventually he eventually he was forced to put he was forced to put it in by by his higher ups and he said, all right, if that's the case, then I'm going to make it as difficult as possible to do it, which is why you had to have a random chance for force sensitivity, and you ha and you had to get you had to go out and find holocrons in order to do it. Um, oh, second Ed. <laughs> now, gr now, granted, um, this ended this ended up this ended up only being a temporary bandage because once. Once um pe once people started map ma once people started putting out maps in the community, um, you ended up with the exact same problem that he w that he was fighting against, um, but I in my case, I was do I was doing a very Moss Eisley inspired kind of campaign, you know, th you know thieves liars you're, you're, and you're trying to get by in the galaxy. Yeah, um, I had I had said in fact I didn't even use I. If Mandalorian was around, I probably would have used season one for that as as our template. But all that all that I had at the time was Firefly, so I used that as a template. It's like Dude, this... I am straight up a brown coat. Yeah. That is that is I said this I said this is the approach that we're doing. We are doing a we, we are doing a western in space. Yeah. You oh, get yeah. you guys are you guys are just a bunch uh, just a bunch of haulers looking for mm. looking for the next job. Whether it be legal, semi-legal, or full-on illegal, mm. um, I'd I'd said I'd said if you if you've got if you've got a few months to spare, use Eve Online as a as a, as a template. But um, nobody feels like dealing with spreadsheets. All right. <laughs> yeah. And I liked I liked Eve Online, but I'm not going to deny that the spreadsheet joke is real. Um. But. I I can I can I can I can certainly understand that and um the funny thing is as bad as bad as Saga Edition was with the, with the Jedi problem um original Star Wars D20 was worse Oh yeah like, oh, in, like by the to by the time you're in the teens the lightsaber can do more damage than a fucking rocket launcher Yeah yeah um but so so, so that we're, we're we're getting to it mm -hmm. Like there's the mechanics. Yeah. That's one of the things that I really liked about Star Wars D6. So my pat or my friend Patrick, mm -hmm. he's actually running a Dark Ages Vampire of the Masquerade game right now for us. Mm -hmm. It's very good. You know, it's called 800 Years a Slave. You're going from like 1180 until modern day, or you know, 1980 or whenever it was made or whatever. Point. He ran a Star Wars Star Wars D6 game, and he essentially said, "Look, the Han Solo of this universe. You guys are starting at two dice uh, average, three if you're you know pretty good, four if you're really good, and then you you go up from there. If you've got force powers, you're just adding dice to it. Han Solo, boom, twelve dice." Like you're starting at two, this guy is at twelve. Why? Because he's an archetype. Um, the emperor, boom, eighteen, nineteen. And this is the problem with the game system. It's great, but you also have this canon. Star Wars is what Star Wars, what's not? Who do you really want to be? You want to be Luke Skywalker and Le Leia Skywalker. Come on. Why wouldn't you want to be that? 
So, pulling all of that into Dreadlore, huh? Could you play a Star Wars game? Yes, you could, sir. You could. And in fact, one of my friends is about to start a game using Dreadlore system to run his Star Wars game. And this is the way you do it: a chaos die. I I can certain I can certainly get that and um. Because of, because of the emphasis on traits, as well as well as the powers from them, I'm get I'm guessing that a big pr a big problem that happens with that happens with martial characters in in certain games is they end up being a one trick pony, mm. um, where that where they're doing nothing but ba nothing but basic attack for their entire career, or just a variation of basic attack. But if you put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. But why, why are they doing that? Um, a lot of a lot of times in my, in my est in my estimation, it's because it's because there is because there's not enough of an incentive to to go to go outside of that, or the or there's no, or the um or the system isn't give isn't isn't give isn't giving much isn't giving much support. Or even, or even further, um, mm. if you're, if you're, if if say say you were running, um, say you're say you're say you're running a ret a, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say a D and D, but just a just a um a very a very white a very white box D and D kind kind of setup. Mm. Let's say let's say that you let's say you descri let's say you describe your um your attack action almost almost. Almost as almost as if you're describing a a stunt. At this, no no matter what, no matter how elaborate or how or how invested you get people into your description, at the end of the day, you're still making the same kind of roll as you would if you just said, "I hit him with my sword." Yep. Correct. So. <clears throat> Here's the problem with D20. As in, you just said it. When it comes down to it, everything, not everything, but most of things, most of the things, are flair. They're just, uh, they're, they're, they're adjectives to describe the number. Right? So, here's my fix. Um, and th it's not a fix for systems, but it's a fix for the expectations of what you want your game to be. That fighter who can, you know, roll massive, you know, has, has four attacks if it's 3.5. Four attacks, you know, it's like a plus 18 what is it, minus five, 13, minus five, eight, three, right? Boom, 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 boom. All they can do is swing their sword, and they have their cleave attack. Or they're playing Red Dragon Inn, as you should do, before you run your D&D &D game, and they're wrecking people, not having to drink. Well, what is that? You go to Planescapes, You've got that fighter who has the constitution of like 25 drinking people under the table. He's the richest dude in town in freaking sigil. He's got all these cutters and bloods who come to his place who can he can send out like gang members and mess with the factions. Right? Mm -hmm. That's how you play a D&D game in my humble opinion. You make the stats work for you. But if you're dealing with just stats and setting, let's go with Star Wars. This is how you adapt Dreadlore system into a Star Wars game. Awesome. You are a smuggler. You've got tons of traits. You've got powers that allow you to shoot shit. You've got instruments um, or gear. I call it ninja gear because I'm... Hard-headed, and I don't want to change it from Ninja Gear. It's called Ninja Gear in the book. Is it Ninja Gear? 
No, but it is called Ninja Gear. You got your like cool blaster rifles and heavy blasting, etc. Mm-hmm. You're a badass. You got people you know because this is a story and who you know matters. Hello, life. You've got uh, places you know and knowledge. You're a badass. Enter the person who's force sensitive. My question as an arbiter, how do you tap into the force? Because you ain't Goku, motherfucker. You're not always Super Saiyan. Mm -hmm. How do you tap into the force? The tradition of the Jedi is to be serene, to have serenity. The tradition of the Sith is to delve into your passions. Tradition of the Force Disciples is whatever the, the hell they philosophy they go to. What is yours? Now we get into powers. I'm adapting powers now. I say, okay, well, you can do what you want. You can write your own powers. What's the power you want? Mind control? Awesome. We're going to make some ranks for that. The first one is a suggestion. The second one is blah. The third one is dominant. How do you root? What is your root? Now I can say, all right, you got a bid to get into that root. Oh, the situation is crazy. There's a grenades explosion or exploding. There's, you know, your ex-girlfriend yelling at you, whatever. Or ex-boyfriend yelling at you, whatever. Mm -hmm. Throw down. Throw down your dice against a threshold. We'll see if you can root so you can use this awesome power. And it balances things. However, the fighter slash mercenary who's got a disintegrating ray gun, that motherfucker just shoots you. What do you bid? I shoot the Jedi. Boom. Make your roll. So it's up to where is the tension? What is the scene? Is the scene the mercenary versus, you know, Boba Fett versus Luke Skywalker? Mm -hmm. What's the scene? Or is it two force users? Oh, shit. Come on. If you're going to do two mages or two force users or whatever, it's not about the role. Because just play Rochambeau. Just play fucking rock, paper, scissors. That's what you should do. Or if you want to have a story, you don't do that. You pull from Big Trouble in Little China. It's a mind battle. How do you root? You've got the Dun Mok going on, right? Mm -hmm. The Sith, their power is passion. Their power is to disturb the Jedi, to get them off course, off kilter. That's how you run it, and that's all in the Arbiter. you got to know the setting you're playing. And you use the rules accordingly. And Dreadlore allows you to do that. So, if you're a big bruiser, yes, you are very, very powerful. You negate damage, you absorb, you have tons of vitality. You're not going to die ever. Yeah, you're powerful. If you're a mage, dude, come on. If you're a thurgist, uh, and you have technology that, that causes unnatural things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, um, what are you shooting for as far as a, as far as a total page count for Dreadlore? Are you thinking 250, or are you thinking that it's going to go bigger? Okay, so for right now, um, I'm at 450. Mm -hmm. But... Minus the redundancies and uh, past the editing, I'm going for 350. So it's going to be a big book. 350, 400. That's where I'm looking for. And it's going to be because <clears throat> the thing is, I'm having to show a rule system as well as a setting. I want people to play the setting. But take it, take it towards Tron. We played a game in that. Take it towards Vampire. I will be doing a Vampire game, long standing. It's gonna be awesome. In Dreadlore, mm -hmm. um, you know, take it to modern era or near future. Awesome. I would like people to play the setting it's in as well, which it's not Tolkien, 
It's not D and D. It's not Greyhawk. It's Dreadlore. There are no humans in Dreadlore. They're 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 called Doina, is what they are. Yes, they're the humans, but they're not human. Why are that? What what does it mean to be human? It means it's like you, right? Mm -hmm. So for that for for all intents and purposes, sure it's human. But that that race, I like that feeling of dark crystal, where there's a point where you're like. The humans are not human. There's no humans in that series mm. that I know of. You know, the Fraggles? Fraggles, come on. Oh, yeah. And with, with that in mind, I know, I, I know, you had, I know you've done a few videos on, on the matter, but um, do you have a release window in mind? Um, at the very at the very least for a, a quick start or something or something similar so that people can get a, get a bitter um, bit of a deeper taste of what you have in store yeah so for the kickstarter people uh i said january 2022 there's a chance it will go a little bit later we'll see i'm going to really try to make that date That'll be um, published physical paperback or hardback on Lulu Print. And then I think the PDFs, although I'm not 100% sure about this, will be on Amazon. Um, <clears throat> as for a quick start, I'm going to be working on that before 2022. And it'll be on the website. So it'll be, hey, look, you're not going to know much about this game, but here's the basic rule set. And... Ask me if you want some advice. But the actual release, 2022, January, maybe as far as March. But my goal is to get it out by January. All right, I can, I, and I will certainly be looking forward to that. Um, with that said, I do want to, I do want to give my belated congratulations on managing to raise um, five thousand bucks when you're asking for thirty eight hundred on the project. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, I was very surprised and I'm, I'm indebted to uh, the efforts of several people. Mm -hmm. And I will, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing um, how, how it, how it, de how it develops with time. But with that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity that takes place here. I dig it. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Oh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much, Meldra. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!